Shalom Abarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we are continuing in our series concerning the book of Revelation. Today we will be doing Daniel chapter 9. But before we begin, let's start out with the blessing of salvation. Let's give all praise and glory and honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, for he's the only way to the Father, and he gives eternal life. So if you know this blessing, go ahead and join in with me. Baruch Atah Yahweh Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Natan Lanu Et Derech HaYeshua Ba Mashiach Yeshua Baruch Hu Blessed are you Yahweh our Elohim King of the Universe who has made the way of salvation through the Messiah Yeshua Blessed be His name Amen. So welcome back everyone to our series here. We are continuing to go through the Book of Revelation. We have taken a detour. We are in Revelation chapter six, verses one and two. We're talking about the white horse rider. And I believe, from my perspective, that the white horse rider is representing the rising of the anti mashiachs empire, and then he eventually takes it over. And so the white horse rider is riding with a bow, All right, It doesn't say he has arrows. That doesn't mean he doesn't have arrows. A lot of people try to make a big deal out of that. I just think we're trying, um, or Yahweh, the father, is trying to make a distinction between this white horse rider and, of course, the white horse rider Yeshua that comes in the future, that the one that he is riding on, okay? There's a distinction there. They're not one and the same. So this one has a bow. The crown that he has on his head is not a royal crown, a crown of kings, all right? It's a garland type crown. The Greek word is different, okay? It's Stephanos, right? It's not diadema, uh, one of royalty. And so there is a distinction here. That's what I believe that the Father is really trying to bring out. It's pointing, in my opinion, toward the empire of the anti-Mashiach rising at a certain period of time. I don't look at the white horse rider, the first seal that is open, as this long period of time of all these wars and these countries doing battle. Okay, That's just from my perspective. I know there are others that hold that position. But because I hold that it is... Um, the empire of the anti-Mashiach, we have detoured to Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9. We're going to go to 10, of course, 11 and 12. We're going to go through all of those so that you can see how that empire rises. Where does it come from? What's the geographical area from which it will come from? That's very important because when we're looking at these empires that are all rising throughout time, one of the significant common thread with all of them is they control the landmass of the nation of Israel, that area that Yahweh has promised to Abraham, all right? They all controlled that area, and I believe that's significant to look at when we are speaking of these different empires within the book of Daniel, amen? So let's go and continue to do a, a short review before we jump into Daniel chapter 9. Let's put all this kind of together, and then we'll move into Daniel chapter 9. All right, so let's remember that the structure of all kingdoms, all of them have what? A spirit behind them. There is a angelic being behind them. In my perspective, they are all fallen, with the exception of the archangel Michael, who is behind the nation of Israel, because Israel has been allotted to Yahweh. When we look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 6 through 8, we see that Yahweh uh, set up the borders of mankind, the nations, their borders, according to the sons of Elohim. And you read that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, all right? Uh, you want to go to the ESV, that brings the truth out, that Bible version, because they use that verse from the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? The Masoretic text is going to say the sons of Israel, I don't believe that that is accurate. The sons of Elohim, what is more consistent throughout the Tanakh is there are angelic beings behind every nation. We're going to see that when we get to Daniel chapter 10. Um, and we also know of a divine council that is in the heavenlies. We see that in Psalm 82, Psalm 89, and other places. Okay. So there is a spirit behind each kingdom that is helping to drive that kingdom helping to influence that kingdom. It also has a king, they have a religion, they have a territory, which is you know, really important in our study. 
territorial land mass, the empire has certain borders. Then of course, all kingdoms have citizens that need to obey the king within that land mass, okay? And oftentimes, when we are talking about a certain empire, it says that certain things went out into all the world or all the world wondered after this or whatever. You're gonna to have to understand that it's talking about that territorial boundaries. And we'll get more into what a synecdoche is too in the future. When we see this term, all the world or all the people, this is not generally to be taken literal, but the all the world or whole world is just a large portion. Okay, it's not literal, it's more idiomatic in a sense of just a large number, okay? So these are all little tips that are very important when you're studying the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, because people just go off on some wild interpretations uh, and they really get you going with sensationalism and everything and they get you worked up and they're not keeping the scriptures within that worldview, within the worldview of the Bible. When Daniel and Yochanan are, you know, writing these books and they're getting the information from the, you know, from the Holy Spirit, from the angels, when they're writing it, uh, from the Father with Yochanan, okay, they're writing it according to that worldview. And that's the worldview we have to look at it from, okay? So we looked in Daniel chapter 2, we saw this statue, okay? And it had various metals. The value of the metals mean something. The strength of the metal means something. And when we get down to Messiah's kingdom, this stone, when it hits it, it's going to take out the entire, um, the entire statue at the same time. That means something. So though this statue has some historical value, historical uh, characteristics about it that the empire of Babylon, the empire of Medo-Persian, possibly the empire of Greece. We know that that Hebrew word there is Yavan, and Yavan is that territory of Asia Minor, Turkey, modern-day Turkey today, and it includes Greece. And so we look at that Greek, Grecian empire and look at the characteristics of that. And then, of course, when we get down to the iron, we see that, in my opinion, it's more reflecting the Islamic empire, meaning the Ottoman empire, which lasted 600 years that crushed all the other three, okay? It broke it into pieces. Rome did not do that. And so we talked, you know, a little bit about that. And so then when we moved into Daniel chapter seven, we were given a repeat, but yet in a different manner. We get four beasts four beasts. And we have the Babylonian representing the lion. We have the bear representing Medo-Persian, the four-headed leper representing the area of Yaban. Okay. And many people think it's the Grecian empire, which it can have some historical value in that sense, but I don't think it fulfills the scriptures um, when we really take a good examination of that. So it's more uh, futuristic too. All of these have a historical fulfillment and a future fulfillment. Again, the fourth beast here, the unique thing now is we get added information about the fourth beast. He uh, is going to have 10 horns on there, and that's going to help us to match the 10 toes there because the iron goes down farther to the feet and it gets iron mixed with clay. And so it tells me that it's that same empire has that, those same characteristics, but now some things are going on that are not adhering one to another. And I think that's more the people are not adhering to the other people that are mixing in with it, that are taking over that empire or part of that empire. And the empire is maybe taking out over other territories. So I kind of lean in that direction. But these four beasts all have characteristics to the statue. They're all similar. Um, in Daniel chapter 7, we get more information. Daniel chapter 2, we know that the head is Babylon. We get to Daniel 7, we know that the silver and the bronze uh, have names, Medo-Persia and then Yavan. We still have no name for the fourth beast, which is the legs of iron. So that's why there's that debate between Rome and Islamic Empire, the Ottoman Empire, because we don't get a name. 
So we have to look at the characteristics and see historically what has fulfilled those characteristics the most. And I believe the Ottoman Empire has, okay? And so then we moved on to Daniel chapter seven and we get two more beasts. We get a ram, we get a goat, and we do get information on those. Um, but I do wanna just show you the verse here in Daniel chapter seven, we have the four beasts. And then it says, after this in my vision at night, I looked and behold, there was a fourth beast, terrifying, frightening, tremendously strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and anything that was left, it trampled with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that came before it. It had 10 horns. And so the reason why I put this one up is it's reflecting the 10 toes. The fourth beast is a repeat of the legs of iron in Daniel chapter two. And then when we get to Daniel chapter eight, uh, starting with verse 20, the ram that you saw with the two horns stands for the kings of Medo, Media and Persia. Verse 21, the buck, the male goat, is the king of Yaban, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. So the large horn between this male goat is the first king, which we know that Alexander the Great was not the first king. He's Alexander the Third. Okay, and there were other kings before him. So when we get to um, a specific time when this empire is fulfilled in the future, it will come forth from a first king. So when it forms, okay, then the first king that comes forth is what we're looking for, the one that will conquer in this manner. And so some people will still say, well, Alexander the Great was the one that conquered in that same way. So they will still stick to Alexander the Great. But there's a reason why it says Yavan, the king of Yavan, it doesn't specifically say the king of Greece. And I think that has more future implication and it could mean the area of Turkey, okay? So first king to me is something that jumps out at me that we need to take in consideration. Alexander the Great was not the first king. He's called Alexander the Third. Okay, so I think we have some future aspects possibly going on here. All right, but we do have the names. So we have the lion is Babylon, the um, ram is the media Persia empire. And then of course, we have the goat, which is the king of Yavan, the area of Yavan. Okay, which I do believe Greece has some characteristics that we need to look at. But we have to remember, when it comes to the statue, scripture is very clear, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, okay? And became like shaft from, sum from summer threshing floors that the wind blows away. And this is Daniel chapter two, verse 35. So the whole thing gets crushed all at one time. And I think that's significant. I don't think we should just read past that quickly. So I think this is whole statue, meaning these four beasts in some manner or way are still gonna rise in the end times, the whole, the whole thing, okay? And of course the iron, maybe because of the strength of the iron is the most dominant empire over all of these regions. Okay, he's got 10 toes, he's got, it's got 10 horns showing that the, um, the fourth beast has a lot of strength, okay? 10 nations coming together uh, and helping to form it. It's within those regions and boundaries of what this empire represents, okay? And it could be in the boundaries, which it will be, we will see that, of the other three. Okay, because what will it do? It will control their regions. It will take them over. It's iron. And it, and it says that it crushes the other ones. Okay. Remember that in Daniel 7.7, 7, it lets us know that that fourth beast crushes and tramples the other three. Okay.
All right, let's also not forget that we read that when the um, 10 horns are a part of the fourth beast in Daniel chapter seven, that the little horn rises up within the 10 and he plucks out three of them. Okay, so we have the 10 toes. And then when we get to Daniel chapter seven, we get more information on the fourth beast, though we still don't get a name. And within those 10 horns that rise up, what comes up in between them or up from them is the little horn. And then three of the horns are plucked up from there. Okay, and so that could just mean they all formed into one or they're completely gone. We'll have to wait and see. But that brings it down to, uh, if he plucks up three, brings it down to eight because it goes down to seven, but you still have the little horn. So either the little horn is ruling the seven or he has his own empire that's included in it. We'll have to wait and see on that also. But it goes down uh, to that formation that we saw. So we're getting more information on that. That's why it's pretty important to understand the fourth beast on really uh, what it is, where it comes from, the territorial boundaries from where it is, because that's where the little horn is going to come up. And then we get more information, like I said, in Daniel chapter 8, we look at where the four kingdoms, because once that one horn is broken from the goat, then four kingdoms come, and then the little horn again comes up from within there. So that helps to narrow down the territory even more. So let's go ahead and look at the map and we'll look at these empires and I'll show you the territorial boundaries of them so we can see where I believe the little horn will eventually rise from. All right, so here's what I did with the empires and their borders. Now this is just a rough draft. I'm not trying to be exact on it. Um, I don't think you need to be exact to get the point of what the scriptures are saying, but it does help um, to have these empires overlaid over one another. So you can look at the general area and we'll see where the small horn, the little horn is gonna come from. Now I did include the empire of Assyria. All right, the Assyrian empire is in the purple because if you go to Isaiah chapter 10, uh, through 12, you see Yahweh talking about the Assyrian. And I believe when you read those verses, it's pointing towards the future, and it's a title for the anti-Mashiach. And you see that again in Micah chapter 5. Um, you'll, when you read that chapter, you'll see Yeshua will defeat him. Um, so that is another place kind of pointing towards the title of the anti-Mashiach being Assyrian. And then, of course, when we get to the Gog and Magog passages in verse, or I'm sorry, chapter 38 of Ezekiel, I believe Gog is a personal name, and it's a personal name or title of the anti Mashiach. Um, let's go ahead and go there real quick, and I'll show you what I mean. All right, in Ezekiel chapter 38, we have. Starting with verse 1, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, prophecy against, I'm sorry, prophesy against him. And say, thus says Yahweh Elohim, behold, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws. I will bring you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly dressed, a vast assembly with breastplate and shield, all of them wielding swords. With them will be Persia, Cush and Put, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his troops, the house of Tagamara, Uh, from the extreme north and all his troops, many peoples with you. So when you look and understand where these countries are that are being spoken of, okay, it is, in my opinion, modern day Turkey, Syria, um, Jordan, 
we have uh, that, and I'm just talking the area here, Kush and Put is like Northern Africa over there. We've got the Persian Empire, which of course is over by modern day Iran. So you have this land mass where this um, Yahweh is bringing this all together. Okay, we're not seeing anything about America or Europe or anything of that nature. So, and when we talk about Gog, I believe that's a personal name title for the anti-Mashiach because when we get down to verse 17, thus says Yahweh Elohim, are you the one that I spoke about in former times through my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them? And that, for me, points towards Isaiah 10, the Assyrian, Isaiah 5. All right, the prophets were speaking of this person, Gog, who is the anti-Mashiach. Okay, so if we go to Isaiah chapter 10. Most scholars will bring you down to... Verse 5, Oi to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the club in their hand in my indignation. I am sending it against an ungodly nation and against the people of my fury. I am commissioning it to take spoil and plunder, to trample them down like mud in the streets. Yet that is not what Assyria intends, nor is it what he is thinking about. Rather, his heart is to destroy and cut down nations, only a few. For he says, aren't all my princes kings? Instead, Kalno, like Kardeshmish, isn't Hamath, like Arpad, isn't Samaria, like Damascus, okay? As my hand has reached the kingdoms of the idols with more graven images than Jerusalem and Samaria, as I've done to Samaria and her idols, won't I also do to Jerusalem and her idols? Therefore, it will come to pass when Yahweh finishes all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty eyes. So for me, this is futuristic. This is pointing towards the anti mashiach He's being given the title of the Assyrian, okay? He is the king of Assyria, and that's telling me a land area from which he is coming from. All right, let's go to Micah chapter 5. There's more we could read on this. You got to read Isaiah 10 all the way to 12 because it ends with the messianic kingdom, the messianic heir coming into existence. So let's go to Micah chapter 5. So here we have, starting with verse 1, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, least among the clans of Judah, from you will come out to me, one to be ruler in Israel. One who's going forth are from of old, from days of eternity, therefore he will give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brothers will return to B'nai Israel. Okay, there's a returning happening. So he will arise and tend his flock with the strength of Yahweh. This is speaking of Yeshua. Yeshua was born in Bethlehem. He is the one that's going to bring back the remnant of his brothers. Okay, he's going to bring them back. Uh, we'll see that in, um, in the future teachings here. When we get to Isaiah chapter 19 and other places where Yeshua sweeps down and starts gathering uh, the lost tribes and bringing them back as he comes to meet the anti-Mashiach. So we'll see that here in the future. So he will arise and tend his flock with the strength of Yahweh and the majesty of the name of Yahweh, his Elohim, and they will live secure, securely. For then he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be Shalom. When Assyria invades our land, when he treads on our citadels, 
then we will raise up against him seven shepherds and eight human princes. They will devastate the land of Assyria with the sword, even Nimrod's land with a drawn blade. He will deliver us from Assyria when he invades our land, when he tramples on our territory. It's speaking of Yeshua saving Israel from the Assyrian. So I look at that as futuristic still to come through Yeshua doing the work and saving B'nai Israel from the anti-Mashiach, the anti-Messiah. Okay, so go ahead and study these passages, Isaiah 10, Micah 5, study Ezekiel 38, Gog is a title of a person, okay, that's where I stand, and it is speaking of the anti-Mashiach. And all that we're seeing here is showing the land area from which the anti-Mashiach is coming from. It's, it's giving you hints. It's giving you little nuggets all along the way where he's coming from, so you make no mistake. The anti-Mashiach is not coming from America. It's not coming from Europe. Okay, we're seeing all of this right here within this area of the Middle East. That's where all the attention is. Amen. And of course, a lot of these people, their ethnicity and who they are, go back to the time of Israel, or they even go back all the way to the time of Abraham with Ishmael, <clears throat> excuse me, and when he married his concubine and had six more sons. Okay. The majority of the people surrounding the area of Israel come from that historical background. They are all uh, in some ways related to Israel, cousins um, in, in a sense, okay? And they're fighting over landmass, they're fighting over inheritance, all right? This all goes, dates back to the time of Abraham and what is happening here. And so I'm not looking to Europe or America. Um, it's not involved here. We're not seeing any um, passages pointing towards that land area, okay? So now let's go ahead. We're going to dive into Daniel chapter 9. I know this went a little bit longer than I expected, but um, I think it's important as we continue to move forward. I'm sorry. Before we get to Daniel chapter 9, we still got to go over this map a little bit deeper. I had just kind of forgot for a moment there that we didn't kind of walk through this map. And for me, this is pretty important too. So we have the Assyrian Empire in purple. We have the Babylonian Empire in red. Okay, that's the head of gold there on the statue. Medo-Persian Empire is the silver chest, two arms. Okay, um, it is the second beast there, which... Um, which we know to be the ram in Daniel chapter 8. And then we have the gold is the Grecian Empire. That's mainly what it was pointing to, though not a full fulfillment. It's the area of Yavan. And Yavan um, is in the area of Turkey and Greece. So that's going to be important. Uh, we, I did put down the Roman Empire just so you could see. That's in the black. And then the green is the Ottoman Empire. So as you can see... Of course, if I'm correct, and the title of the anti mashiach one of his titles is the Assyrian, then we got to look to the area of the purple there. And that's where he's going to come from. And you know what? That falls right in within the gold, because we know the gold represents Yavan. And when the horn, the one horn is broken, four horns or kingdoms come forth. Okay, so, and then the little horn comes up within the four kingdoms, so that's the area of the gold, so we're looking in that area to see, and that's right within the purple, and then we have the green, which I believe represents the Ottoman Empire, that re represents the iron legs, okay, that re represents the fourth kingdom that has the ten horns, and up from those ten horns comes the little horn, who plucks out three, and so the Ottoman Empire, in my sense, was the one that crushed, okay, the other three. It crushed Greece. It crushed Medo-Persian. It crushed the Babylonian Empire, all right? It crushed that land area, and, and it uh, trampled it. 
the Roman Empire didn't do that. Number one, it didn't make it into the area of Iran. It, it you know, got into the area of Iraq, but the Parthians kept pushing the Romans back. And so they never crushed the Medo-Persian uh, people. The Parthians kept pushing them. So for me, the Roman Empire is not a strong suit for the uh, beast with iron legs, the beast that is made of iron that crushes and tramples the other ones. The Ottoman Empire did that. It pillaged okay, the resources, killed the men. The women and children were brought into slavery, made concubines and wives of people. The Romans didn't do that. They let people worship their gods. They used them as a resource of revenue okay, to bring money into um, Rome. So it just is not fitting for me with, with the Roman Empire. The Ottoman Empire is a better fit. So we look at that area. That's where the 10 kings were going to come up. And the little horn comes from within that area. And if you look today, a good 90% or so of that area today is Muslim. All right. And more and more, the other areas are becoming um, increasingly through immigration influenced by Muslim, by the Muslim faith, you know, the area of Greece and Romania and those areas. Over the years to come, they're still being more influenced. So we could see more of a dominant influence in those areas. Those 10 kings will rise, okay? The Antichrist will rise from within that empire. And if we go down to Greece, we saw, and we will see in Daniel chapter 11, there's going to be a foreshadow of the Antichrist in a person called Antiochus the Fourth from the Seleucid Empire, because that empire comes out after Alexander the Great dies. All right, there's generals that take over his empire, and the one that becomes very dominant uh, is Antiochus the Seleucid Empire. Antiochus the Fourth becomes known as the one who foreshadows the Antichrist. So that area, that region is going to be very important because if he reflects the anti-Mashiach, then that region is where the little horn will come from. And guess what? We're going to see that Antiochus IV controlled much of the area where the purple is. Okay, uh, He controlled parts of Turkey. He controlled uh, parts of Syria, parts of Iraq, parts of Iran. And that all fits the pattern of the empire's and the titles that reflect the anti-Mashiach, where he will come from, that region. So this map to me is very important. Um, I believe then it is showing us, it will continue to show us that the anti-Mashiach could come from Turkey, he could come from Syria, he could come from Iraq, okay? He could come from Jordan, he could come from Lebanon. We just have to wait and see. Within those territorial boundaries, that little horn's gonna come up. Okay, right now I'm leaning towards Turkey, but I'm not dogmatic about it, okay? So now let's go ahead and get to Daniel chapter 9. All right, so in Daniel chapter 9, we want to start with verse 20, and it states, while I was speaking, okay, this is Daniel, and praying, confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications before Yahweh, my Elohim, on behalf of the holy mountain of my God, or my Elohim. Yes, while I was praying, Gabriel, the one I have seen in the earlier vision, came to me swiftly about the time of the evening offering. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have come now to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your request, a message went out, and I have come to declare it to you, for you are greatly esteemed. Consider, therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed concerning your people in your holy city. Okay, so this is Yahweh not giving up on Israel. He's decreeing 70 weeks for them. Okay, this means they will be included. All right, what's the goal? He's going to put an end to transgression. For who? Israel. Okay, now remember, 
that the blessing that is given to Abraham's seed will go out to all the nations. And so it includes Israel. You can never have Israel ousted or replaced or anything of that nature. You can't have it. It's for them because from there comes the blessing to all nations. Okay. So it's not excluding the Gentiles, but the focus is Israel. She is the bride. Okay. Not the church. She is the bride. All right. So it says to put an end to transgression, to bring sin to an end to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the holy of holies. Do you know that that landmass, that area where the holy of holies once sent is going to be anointed and cleansed, all right? Not only did Yeshua cleanse the holy place and the holy of holies in the heavenlies, but he's going to cleanse all the earth, and especially where the holy of holies was here on earth also, okay? He starts out doing it in the heavenlies, but he's also going to anoint it here on earth, okay? His blood can cleanse us of all sins. It can cleanse the entire earth of its sins, and he will restore all things, amen? He will bring a what? New heaven and new earth. He's restoring everything. So this all makes perfect sense for me. So no one understand from the issuing of the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem until the time Mashiach, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be rebuilt with plaza and moat, but it will be in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, Mashiach will be cut off and have nothing. All right, so let's look at a little bit of a breakdown of the seven weeks and 62 weeks. All right, so looking at those passages, we see that seven or one week equals seven consecutive prophetic years. Okay, when it talks about weeks, I think those are years. Every week equals seven years. So we have seven sevens are 49 weeks, 49 weeks are 49 consecutive prophetic years. We have 62 sevens are 62 weeks. Okay, we saw that there. 62 weeks are 434 consecutive prophetic years. 69 sevens are 69 weeks. 69 weeks are 483 consecutive prophetic years. So from the time of the decree of rebuilding Jerusalem, Okay, the city, not just the temple, the whole city. Okay, and then there's another 62 weeks. So there's seven weeks for that. That's 49 years to rebuild the city from the time the decree goes out to the rebuilding of the city, 49 years. And then we have 62 weeks until Mashiach comes and what is cut off. And that will equal 434 prophetic years. Okay, when you put those together, you get 69 weeks out of the 70. Okay, you get 483 consecutive years, all the way up to the time that the Mashiach is cut off. That's the death and resurrection of Yeshua. This brings us to this slide here. We have Daniel's 70 weeks. Okay verses 24 through 27. So we have the 49 years here of rebuilding the city, okay? This is uh, right around 457, 458 BC. Some scholars will say this is when the edict goes out during the time of Ezra, okay? Read the book of Ezra, read the book of Nehemiah, and you will get that picture, you'll get that time frame. And then uh, once the city is done, now we got the time frame from there until Mashiach is cut off, okay? And so 31, you know, some people say 33, some people say 30, 32. It's just right within that range between 30 and 33, okay? He died and was resurrected. So we got the 62 weeks of years there, making up 483 years. We've got seven left. Okay, now some people will say, well, that 
was just consecutive and they will somehow jump it to 70 AD when the destruction of the temple happens and they'll see, they'll be like, look, there's the 70 years. Okay, it's all complete, it's all done. The problem is it doesn't fit scripture. Okay, Yeshua doesn't return, we don't have the resurrection. There's a lot of problems with that theory. It just doesn't hold water. Okay, there's no abomination of desolation. They try to, you know, twist and, you know, kind of fit it in there. You know, you'll see a lot of them. They're called preterists. There's, you know, partial preterists. There's uh, full preterists. And they will say the destruction of the temple, that is the end of the 70 weeks. And see, then they pull this replacement theology. Okay. The church has replaced Israel. Israel is done. No, the 70 weeks were for who? They were for Israel to bring in everlasting righteousness. And now you're going to exclude them from that? I don't think so. It's to anoint the holy of holies. Okay? Anoint that area and that land. Hasn't happened yet. It's coming. There's just a lot of problems. We're going to see more problems with that preterist view as we go. So we're still waiting for that last week, that last seven years. And I believe the time of the Gentiles is the time, of course, because that seven years, it gets really bad. The Gentile nations come against Israel, and they try to wipe her out. The anti-Mashiach rises, and he tries to, you know, dominate her and take her over. It's the time of the Gentiles reaching its fullness, the evilness of the Gentile nations reaching its fullness. Then all of Israel will be saved. Okay? At that point, Yeshua when they think they just got her, that they can just totally dominate Israel, take her over, no problem, Yeshua will come. Amen. And then all of Israel will be saved. And so that's why I call it the prophetic gap, not the church age. Okay. It's speaking of the evilness of the empires of the world, the Gentile empires. Amen. All right. So let's get back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9. So we have here the 70 weeks are decreed for the nation of Israel and for the holy city. Okay, he will fulfill it. He will purify it. Israel, because Jeremiah, Yermiyahu, chapter 31, verses 30 through 34, says the new covenant is with Israel. You can't replace Israel. It's with her. This is all for her benefit right here. She is the bride. She's going to be a part of it. Okay, so that the blessing can go out to all nations. Now, again, from the issuing of the decree to restore and to build Jerusalem, the city, until the time of Mashiach, the prince, there shall be seven weeks, 49 years, and 62 weeks, right? 434 years. We got 483 years. Okay, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Okay. He won't be on this earth. Then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, many people think this is Rome 70 AD. I don't. I think this will be talking of the anti-Mashiach. Okay, the anti-Mashiach, that one that is to come. He will take over the city and take over the sanctuary. But it says, but his end will come like a flood, speaking of the anti-Mashiach. When Yeshua comes and takes him out, it will come like a flood to him. Okay? I don't think that happened in 70 AD. It didn't come like a flood to him. Look at the Roman Empire, how it just continued to go on. All right? That's not going to happen. It, again, the preterist view just doesn't hold. All right, so... But his end will come like a flood until the end of the war that is decreed. There will be destruction. Then he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. Be careful of the then. Let's go ahead and look at the Greek. All right, so Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. We have the Vav here. 
And it's better rendered, I think, and he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. It's just giving you adding information of the prince who is to come who will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, it's just giving you added information so that we know where the 70th week comes in. It comes in when the anti Mashiach comes. He is going to be the one that will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And it's telling you how that's going to happen. He will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and the offering. He's taking over the city, destroying the sanctuary. He's putting an end to it. Okay, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolation, and even until the consummation and which is determined is poured out on the desolation. Okay, so I think the word and is a better rendering. We got to be careful of our English translations and kind of how it conveys in your mind. You're reading the English translation because translators are trying to get you to see a certain picture. But when we go back to the Hebrew and we put it back into its original context and see things, sometimes I believe that the scholars um, in some translations get it wrong. And other, that's why we have many different translations. You need to keep three or four of them next to you because scholars have different views on how to interpret certain passages. You need to take them all into account and see which one um, is more consistent with the passage and with the context of the Bible. So for me, the word and, which is right connected to the vav or wow, you know, depending on how you pronounce that um, letter, but the letter uh, can mean and. And so, and he will confirm, it's connecting the two passages. Okay. So it says, then the pr people, the prince who uh, is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, but his end will come like a flood until the end of the war that is decreed, there will be destruction. Well, wait a minute, how is this going to happen? Who is this prince going to be? Well, let me give you some more information. And he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. That's how he's going to do this. But in the middle of the week, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. Oh, I see now how he's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, that's how I read it. And that's a Hebraic way of reading it, I believe. You see that where the Bible will say one thing in one verse, and then the next couple of verses, it'll kind of explain how that will come to pass. Okay. And so if I am correct, and it's the Ottoman Empire reflecting the anti-Mashiach, he's going to come up from within that territory. If he's called the Assyrian, he's going to come up from with that territory. And we're going to see soon uh, in chapter 11 that a foreshadow of the anti-Mashiach will be Antiochus IV. And for those of you that may think, well, who is that, Antiochus IV? That's where the story of Hanukkah comes. One of the reasons why we celebrate Hanukkah is because that story was a foreshadow of the one to come. So there is a future Hanukkah to come. Antiochus IV, he uh, outlawed Torah, okay, in the land of Israel. He was actually having people put to death who tried to obey Torah, circumcise their children, you know what I mean, tried to obey uh, Shabbat and everything. He had it outlaw. They were putting people to death for doing that. He actually took over the temple. Amen. He defiled it, offered a pig on the idol, I mean, on the altar. And then a band of Jews rose up, and one of them called Judah. Okay. He was the son of Matthias, who was a priest. And Matthias, the father, he actually kind of started the rebellion, and Judah. Uh, what became the commander of Israel's armies. They called him Judah Maccabee, Maccabee meaning the hammer. And his armies, over a course of about three years or so, they won back the temple area from Antiochus IV. They cleansed it, started up the offerings again. And so this was all a reflection of the future one to come. So we celebrate Hanukkah as believers in Yeshua. I'm a Gentile, so as believers in Yeshua, I celebrate Hanukkah too for the victory that Yeshua gave them 
for because if there was no temple, there would be no Yeshua who came and died on the cross and fulfilled all those passages that needed to be fulfilled for us uh, on his first coming. And so Hanukkah needed to happen um, as far as the victory and everything else so that the temple would be standing. And Yeshua is going to do the same thing in the future. When this future anti-Mashiach comes in and takes over the city, puts an end to the uh, sacrifices and offerings in the sanctuary, Yeshua will come and give them the victory. Amen. And so we're seeing that right here, a reflection. So that's why we got to study those maps. We got to study those empires. Antiochus IV tells us where the little horn will come from. Amen. And so that's why I got that area of Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq in that general region is what we're looking at. And when the 10 uh, horns are formed first, the little horn comes up later. We're still waiting for that. We haven't seen the 10 uh, kings formed in that landmass in the old Ottoman Empire area. So we haven't even seen that. We haven't seen the little horn come up and pluck three yet. I don't think we've seen the uh, king that will come from Yavan with the one horn, okay? The future fulfillment of it where it breaks off and the four kingdoms come so the little horn can come up. From my perspective, that hasn't happened yet. So we are still waiting for quite a few things to happen. And whatever happens in America, hey, that's something we have to deal with. We still need to evangelize the gospel. Uh, the mark of the beast is not coming from America. Um, and so there's a lot of things that we got to talk about. Will the mark even reach America? That's something to talk about. Will it reach worldwide? Will the anti mashiachs empire cover the entire globe? We're going to find that out in the next coming chapters. We're going to go to chapter 10 uh, next time together, and we're going to really get into that spirit behind an empire. And I'll show you a lot of more details on that. And then we will get into uh, more to see how chapter 10, 11, and 12 are all kind of coming together. They all are one. Remember, there were not chapters and verses back when Daniel wrote this. This is all one continual story and book. So sometimes the breaking up of verses and chapters can kind of throw us off a little bit. Chapters 10, 11, and 12 are all like one big story. So we'll go ahead and look at that starting next time together. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and bring this to a close. I'd like to end with the Psalm uh, of 67, Tehillah 67. Amen. In Psalm 67, verses 1 through 8, it states, May Elohim be gracious to us and bless us. May he cause his face to shine upon us, so that your way, Yahweh, may be known on earth, and your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O Elohim. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples fairly and guide the nations on the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O Elohim. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its harvest. Elohim, our Elohim, will bless us. Elohim will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. So I hope this was helpful to you. Thank you for joining me and staying with us on this journey of the book of Revelation. And until we meet again, everyone, shalom.